And I will say up front, as I said last time, that I'm not here to suggest that every course of action pursued by important churchmen, and even, even in this case a pope, was wise or prudent. Uh, in fact, I think it has damaged the church's reputation tremendously. At the same time, though, in all fairness, I think it's only fair that both sides receive a fair hearing. And typically that's not what happens. What happens is Galileo is portrayed as the great hero who is irrationally put upon by ignoramuses from the Catholic Church. Well, it's time to at least hear both sides. No period of history is more misunderstood or underappreciated than the Middle Ages, the 10 centuries from the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century to the start of the Renaissance in the 15th. The first question is, what did Christianity or religion have to do with starting and continuing the Dark Ages? Well, nothing. The so-called Dark Ages began for a wide variety of reasons, most of them having to do with invasions by barbarian tribes and incursions of plague. The second question is, how dark were the Dark Ages? Well, you can get a partial answer from the fact that these days historians call it the Early Middle Ages. Beyond that, there's a certain range of opinion. Many historians say that they weren't dark at all, and they note a wide variety of factors explaining why. On the other hand, there are also some historians who say, yeah, they were dark, but that's compared to the Roman Empire, and they'll cite some points in their favor. There's one thing these two schools of thought have in common, though. Neither one blames Christianity for the Dark Ages happening in the first place, or as being a negative influence in that period. In fact, they see it instead as, as one author puts it, the most important framework within which late antique culture survived. That leads to another popular graphic used by Fundy Atheists, one that suggests that we'd all be living the life of the Jetsons by now if it hadn't been for the Dark Ages. Well, no again. The fact is that while the Romans prior to the early Middle Ages had certain technological advances in agriculture, they had no interest in using them, because they had slave labor to do the work. They also weren't interested in allowing the barbarians all around them having those advances. So, while the early Middle Ages may not have had as much technological innovation as it might have, that was for a good reason. It was an age when application of existing technology, which the Romans had but didn't use, was a priority. And without that, there couldn't have been any more innovation later on. One final point. Fundy atheists like Green seem to assume that they were called dark because religion was in charge. As they see it, there was a lot of stupidity and superstition around. But the term Dark Ages originated because we had relatively few written historical sources from that time. In other words, because we were in the dark about a lot of history. Religion actually didn't rule the world, and it certainly didn't cause or encourage ignorance. In fact, it was the church that kept and preserved the great works of the pagan authors like Tacitus. We'll make a good start by dispelling some nonsense. The people of the Middle Ages did not believe the earth was flat. They knew it was round. The ancients said it was round. The fathers of the church said it was round. They saw its shadow during an eclipse of the moon and the shadow was round. They saw masks of ships sinking below the horizon, round. Jesus himself must have known about different time zones. He spoke of his second coming, which will be in an instant. Now he said two people would be in bed at night, so one would be taken and one left. But at the same time, two women would be grinding corn in the morning and one taken, the other left. And two men in the field later in the day, one taken, one left. So Jesus understood that at one time, some parts of the earth would be morning, some parts afternoon, and other parts at night. One myth is that there wasn't any scientific progress for a thousand years from 500 AD to 1500 AD. For example, people in the Middle Ages believed that the Earth was flat, didn't they? Nobody, as far as we know, thought in the Middle Ages that the Earth is flat. It was certainly never part of church doctrine and nobody was ever persecuted for saying that the Earth is a sphere. Everybody was perfectly well aware of that. You know, for the past 2,000 years, Christian scholarship has been unanimous that the Earth is a sphere. And how is it that all those scholars, looking at these Greek and Hebrew words, have come to the conclusion that the Bible is not teaching that the Earth is flat? Yeah. One of the greatest successes in human history is called the scientific method. And that was pioneered by Christians. And the flat earthers and the, the geocentrists, 
they have to reject the last 500 or more years of scientific advances in physics. I come from Australia and New Zealand, as you can probably tell from my accent. But this new flat earthism clearly has a northern hemisphere bias, with the North Pole at the centre. But for one thing, we can see the Southern Cross constellation. It's even on our flags. But people in Europe and America can't see it. But we can't see the North Star from the South. This shows that we are indeed on different halves of a sphere. Also, South Africa is in the same time zone as Germany, but at night the Germans see the North Star while South Africans are viewing the Southern Cross, the same constellations as seen from New Zealand. Actually, leading Christian scholars in the Middle Ages used the same arguments in principle. For example, the Venerable Bede, John Sacrobosco, and Thomas Aquinas. But the arguments are so much stronger now that we can communicate instantly all around the world. Nobody, flat earther or a geocentrist, or wouldn't disagree, I should say, that the Sun and Jupiter are larger than the Earth. That being the case then... Actually, the flat earthers deny that the sun is larger than the earth. Oh my goodness. Because the modern flat earth people, they've got a plate like earth. In the old the old version people might have thought the sun goes under the earth and gets hauled and then pops up again, but they have a spotlight sun that just does this over flat earth. It has to be smaller than the earth and close, maybe a thousand miles away or something like that. So really they've rejected all experimental science, because we can measure the distance to the sun. It's easy. All you have to do is have two people on the earth to look at the sun at the same time and measure the angle. And that angle is so small that the sun has to be millions of miles away, because if it was only a thousand miles away, you get a very steep angle like that, and you, using simple you know, high school trigonometry, you could figure out the distance. Galileo and his work were in fact welcomed and celebrated by prominent churchmen. For instance, in late 1610, Father Christ Christopher Clavius wrote to tell Galileo that his fellow Jesuit astronomers had confirmed the discoveries that Galileo had made through his telescope. Galileo was greeted with enthusiasm in Rome in 1611. There was a day of lectures given in his honor. He wrote, I have been received and shown favor by many illustrious cardinals, prelates, and princes of this city. He enjoyed a long audience with Pope Paul V and enjoyed a day of activities in his honor at the Jesuits' Roman College. In 1612, for the first time in print, Galileo said that he favored the Copernican system, at least the part about the sun being in the center. He believed in the heliocentric system. Well, this did not get him in trouble. In fact, in this particular writing, one of the many enthusiastic letters of congratulation he got came from the future Pope Urban V, uh, pardon me, Urban VIII, who in fact was the, was the Pope who, as we'll see, later got Galileo in some trouble. But in 1612, there was no trouble at all with what Galileo said, and yet it's the same thing. So what's, the, what's going on here? Okay, this is a good quote because it's done in a, by a well-known scientist, uh, New York, or New uh, Mexico, sorry, History of Science professor, Timothy Moy. And he was writing in this magazine called Skeptical Inquirer, and in this magazine, he concluded, and I quote because he said in a much better way, much more succinct way than I could ever say what happened historically. And he said, it's more historically accurate to conclude that the main opponents of the new Copernican position, this is the idea that the Earth is not the center of the solar system, but the Sun is. This is the Copernican position. Were academicians teaching science in the universities and that much, if not most, he says, now this is an agnostic saying this, writing in an atheist agnostic magazine, most of Galileo's support came from church officials. This is far more historically accurate. But that's not what is usually taught or said, is it? Not at all. The opposite is what's taught. The, what's taught is that the church was opposed to Galileo and the academicians were on his side. And in fact, the opposite, by and large, was true. This is a picture of Galileo, and the problem basically, as Professor Drake says, is that Galileo's ideas were looked upon favorably by certain influential churchmen and scientists, causing jealousy, and that was a lot of the problem among the other scientists. They were jealous of his discoveries that he made. Human nature raising its ugly head. That's by and large what it was. Uh -huh. That's, a, that's, that's by and large the, the main problem. 
and the academic opposition to Galileo was because the natural philosophies, the natural philosophies that they held at that time were firmly based on Aristotelianism. Aristotle was a great philosopher and the scientists at that time, unfortunately, put a lot of stock in what he had to say. And the fact is, a lot of what he had to say was wrong. And Galileo contradicted and, and what he Aristotle had to say. And Aristotle would have believed that the Earth was the center? Oh, yes, right. Okay. And Aristotle also looked at a different way of learning. Uh -huh. Galileo stressed we should learn by doing research. We should trust our senses. Aristotle said, no, we should trust reason and not our senses. So they had fundamentally different ways of looking at the universe and learning about the universe. Huh. Many in the church, Moy says, were anxious for new ideas. And the honors it bestowed upon Galileo made his enemies, Galileo's enemies, very, very upset. Furious is what Moy says. They were jealous of the special treatment that Galileo got. He was given special treatment by the church. He had a big salary. He had a raise. He had everything. And they were very upset because of this. So the church, instead of opposing Galileo, was supporting him in many, many, many ways, not only financially, but also in other ways as well. Because we all, as we've seen, this Pope, Urban VIII, had previously praised Galileo had had no problem with Galileo publishing the Copernican theory and even assured him that the church would never condemn this theory. So it can't just be that the church refuses to allow evidence or refuses to allow science. This was all allowed. The Galileo tragedy occurred because of the convergence of all these factors. Now, that doesn't excuse what happened. Galileo was, uh, in 1633, told that uh, he could not publish in this uh, area at all. Does not excuse that. But on the other hand, it helps us to understand it a little bit better, and that's important too. Now, a good many scholars have begun to argue that people at the time, at least some of them, understood that the sentence against Galileo was intended in large part personally against him. Because, for example, Father Boscovich, whom we talked about last time, the father of atomic theory, openly used the idea of a moving earth in his work. Nobody got, he never got in trouble, was never hauled before any church tribunal. So, as I say, a great many people have said that it was aimed personally at Galileo. And I should stress the church got involved in this primarily because the scientists were trying to quiet Galileo. How do you quiet your scientific opponent? One way is to get him declared a heretic. If you can get the church on your side against your scientific enemies, you've got your case made. And that's what, they, that's what his scientific peers did. And Moy added that. This is a picture of uh, Dr. Moy. Well, scholars have been unable to come to a consensus on why Galileo was tried by the Inquisition. There are probably a lot of reasons why. Many of them had to do with politics. And many of them had nothing to do with science. Almost all historians agree, he says, that it was not primarily because Galileo believed in the Copernican heliocentrism. Now, having said all this, um, as I say, my, my purpose here is not to say that there was no wrong done or that this episode is something to celebrate. But at the same time, I think we can understand that what actually happened here was the fruit not of any mythical Catholic hostility to science, but merely the unfortunate convergence of a variety of factors occurring at the same time. Because what we've seen in these past few episodes is that the church's achievements when it come to, comes to science are legion and are substantial. More nonsense. The Middle Ages were cheerless. Quite the reverse. They were full of color, of celebrations involving everybody in town. They invented the carnival. They revived popular drama, which had lain dormant for a thousand years. Whatever they did, whether it was sinning or fighting or repenting or falling in love or traveling thousands of miles to Rome or to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they did it with energy and gusto. What do we owe to the Middle Ages? How about the university? Medieval man invented it. For the first time in the history of the world, you could go to Paris or Bologna or Padua or Oxford or Prague or Cologne and study under masters of law, medicine, philosophy, and theology, and your degree designating you as a master or a doctor would hold good anywhere in Europe. It was an international community of scholars. A young Thomas Aquinas, born in southern Italy at the beginning of the 13th century, would travel to Cologne to study philosophy 
under the philosopher biologist Albert the Great, then to Paris, where he taught theology and philosophy, then to Rome and back to France. And this sort of thing was the rule among scholars, not the exception. How about modern science? Thomas's teacher, Albert, was a biologist. Why should that surprise us? Medieval man believed that God made the world as an ordered whole. They learned it both from scripture and from pagan thinkers, such as Aristotle. Science did not burst on the scene with Galileo. Copernicus died in the 16th century, but he was a priest astronomer at a Polish university founded in the Middle Ages. He wasn't even the first man to suggest that the Earth orbited the Sun. Others had ventured the suggestion. Most prominent was the late medieval Nicholas of Cusa, a philosopher and a cardinal in the church. In the 16th century, Nicholas Copernicus put forward the idea that the Earth goes around the Sun rather than the Sun going around the Earth. People sometimes say today that the Christian church persecuted Copernicus. It put him in prison or even put him to death. There's one problem with this claim. Copernicus wasn't killed, not for his scientific ideas, not for any other reason. He wasn't put in prison. He wasn't persecuted. When he died, he was a member of the church in good standing. This is another dishonest claim about the conflict between science and faith. Copernicus puts the sun at the center. Now, Copernicus died in 1543, and he in fact, on, as he was practically on his deathbed, he got to see, he had just published his work at the urging, in fact, of cardinals. Catholic cardinals urged him to publish his work. And he dedicated his famous book to Pope Paul III when it was published in 1543. He was afraid primarily of ridicule, not by, not by theologians, but by astronomers who had very good arguments against the idea that the earth was in motion. As I say, we'll get to those later. But the Copernican system shared much in common with Ptolemy, it just switched the earth and the sun, but it was subject to no formal Catholic censure until the Galileo case in the next century. His system, his so-called heliocentric system, was taught as a legitimate theory at Jesuit universities throughout the 16th century. Nobody got in trouble for this, and so on and so forth. It was just fine. It was treated as a theory. Isaac Newton is credited with the discovery of gravity, one of the greatest scientists, arguably, who ever lived. Uh, he professed to be a Christian. And a creationist. The laws of planetary motion devised by Johannes Kepler. Another Christian. Great another testimony. Christian, uh, etc. Moy added at the Galileo Fair, the church continued to promote research. They even turned entire cathedrals into pinhole cameras to measure scientific facts. So they were continually supportive of the uh, science. The church was. The church provided the framework in which science was possible. It made us believe that the universe could be understood by our minds and encouraged us to engage in this type of undertaking. And finally, be even beyond that, the church encouraged, yes, believe it or not, the free interchange of ideas. It encouraged a culture of debate and discussion. That was the culture that was fostered in the university system of the Middle Ages. How about architecture? If the Middle Ages were dark and ignorant, how come ordinary people, masons, carpenters, painters, sculptors, glazers, erected the most beautiful and majestic buildings to grace the earth, the Gothic cathedrals, without power tools, with pulleys and winches and scaffolding in their bare hands, they built up lacework in stone and glass, flooding vast interior spaces with color and light. We have nothing to match their complexity and beauty. And art? Studying the ancients, medieval man produced whole genres of art that the world had never seen. There had never been anything like Dante's Divine Comedy, or Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, or the Arthurian legends of Chrétien de Troyes, or the paintings of Giotto, or the astonishingly beautiful and precise work of the illuminators of manuscripts. What else do we owe to them? Western music. They invented our musical notation and Western harmony, not to mention the humble carols we enjoy at Christmas time. A tradition of local self-government, 
Witness the chartered towns all over Europe, free associations of men united for the common good, friars, guildsmen, members of lay orders devoted to good works, people who established schools, orphanages, and hospitals. When we think about the medieval ages, some of the in images that spring to mind are things like abject poverty, backbreaking labour, people literally living very close to the land in hovel-like conditions. Well, sure, yes, poverty did exist in the medieval times. Compared to today, however, we look at that and we say, yes, this was indeed terrible. But we have to ask ourselves, in comparison to what? If we go back from the medieval period to, for example, Roman times or even before that, I think what you will find in between is 500 years of technological and intellectual development in such a way that we can say that people in the medieval period were certainly better off than your average slave living in ancient Rome or in ancient Mesopotamia or in ancient Greece. So yes, let's make comparisons. But the point is to make comparisons that are meaningful, Par comparisons which reflect the fact of technological progress. And let's not project back our own expectations upon a period in which we see more technological development happening than it happened before. When people think of the Roman Empire, they typically think of things like the Colosseum or the Pantheon or the great aqueducts or the Roman roads, these incredible engineering feats uh, that Rome left behind. And they are very, very impressive. They are also built by slave labor. But when you take a look at the early Middle Ages, they don't have those kinds of monuments. But what they have is something far more valuable. What they have are inventions. They develop new techniques in metallurgy so that ultimately by the 15th century, they've invented the blast furnace. On and on and on. There are loads of, of inventions that occur during the Middle Ages that are designed specifically to increase productivity and decrease drudgery and labor. And that is an incredible monument, not something visible like the Colosseum, but it's an incredible monument to the medieval's dedication to the dignity and value of people and of their efforts. And there are lots of other examples of the way that we have simply assumed ignorance on the part of people in the Middle Ages. We assume that there was no technological advance, but in fact, uh, spectacles, the windmills, the heavy plough, horse harnesses, crop rotation, the mechanical clock, crucially, and the perfection of printing and gunpowder, perhaps less happily, all took place during the Middle Ages. Didn't the church forbid dissection? Well, that is very interesting that the church, in fact, didn't try to stop human dissection. Almost all societies have had a taboo against cutting up dead bodies, especially the ancient Greeks, the Romans, and the Islamic world. And in fact, ancient Greek doctors were unable to dissect human beings. They had to make do with dissecting animals like pigs and Barbary apes, and that meant that they made mistakes. And it wasn't until 14th century Italy that human dissection really started and became an essential part of medical education. And then gradually the mistakes that the ancient Greeks had made were uncovered. It's actually remarkable that the Christian church didn't try to stop this happening, simply given that every other culture had had a taboo against this. But in fact it hadn't, and it's likely that human dissections began with legal autopsies, and some of those we know were actually ordered by the church, by the Pope directly. Wasn't there a Pope who excommunicated Halley's Comet? Well, no, no Pope has excommunicated Halley's Comet, although there is a, a story that this happened during the 15th century. It's a story which results from a conflation of sources. It would, of course, be an extremely silly thing for a pope to do, and thankfully it never happened. Likewise, there's still a very popular belief that 
the church tried to ban the number zero. Exactly why they would choose to do this is usually not explained. But again, that's simply a myth. If I said to you something like, in fact, the clockwork motion of the planets, I think, is an attribute of God's design, uh, would you agree with something like that? Oh, absolutely. Of course, Dr. Reed, uh, unfortunately, some people would say that you and I are somehow misled or even worse, that we might be part of some sort of conspiracy or we just haven't understood and we've been taken in by some sort of false science. Well, as we mentioned, you are a scientist. You could, uh, you could test and observe these things, but um, you're a Bible-believing Christian. So what would you say to folks like that? I came to my own conclusions by studying the Bible myself. And uh, it was a while before I found I could get teaching that helped me understand some of the deeper things of the Bible. But to me, the Bible is just very clear as to how the universe was put together, why man was created, why we exist, and the fact that our Creator wanted us to know Him, which is mind-blowing, really, to be part of the universe, but at the same time, to have a relationship with the one that created the universe as well as created me. Now, one of the, the great rocket scientists of our time was Dr. Werner von Braun, who, uh, who at the end of the Second World War, of course, he was a German and he worked for the Nazis. And my understanding is he became a Christian during his time here in America. And I wrote in my book, Alien Intrusion, that he believed that uh, our endeavors and in searching in space would, would reveal the handiwork of the Creator. Well, you've developed craft that have been out there. What, what would you say in that regard? Well, first of all, I worked with Von Braun. He provided the rocket that launched our satellite, the Redstone. But um, I became a Christian after age 40. Von Braun also later in life. Both events were beyond the time that we knew each other. I have regrets I didn't track him down and, and talk about our faith, but I didn't. But he... Uh, he was a great thinker, he was very interested in space travel, but uh, again, he gave the glory to God to put it all together. I've got a book at home uh, from a, uh, an astronaut who's been on board the space shuttle, and it's full of beautiful colored photographs of the Earth from space. I can see my home country, Australia, and you know we can see the, the west coast of America where we are now. And of course, to me, one of the most profound photographs ever taken in all of human history was Apollo 8. Mm -hmm. Borman, Lovell and Anders, when they circumnavigated the moon and on Christmas Day, they broadcast a message back to the earth. They read from Genesis 1, but we see earth rise. For all the people back on earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. That it was good. You know, the big blue marble, they called it. And but again, it shows the precision with which the universe exists. The fact that the earth rose at a certain time, they were all prepared to, to photograph it and gave them a real realization as to how vast the universe is and how marvelous. Dr. Richter, thank you very much. But this quote here from Sir Fred Hoyle, I think summarizes the problem as I see it. The popular belief is that the Copernican Revolution and the Inquisition of Galileo are things of the past. He says in this book he wrote, if anything, the situation may have gotten worse today. 
with the Industrial Revolution conferring upon human beings a degree of arrogance not seen before. So he concludes that intolerance in science today is worse than it was in Galileo's day. And a summary of this, Darwinists have worked hard to gain the support from both sides, the clergy and the common people. And it's unfortunate for science, I point out, it's unfortunate for science that there is so little tolerance for non-Darwinists. And a lot of researchers now have concluded that this is the case. Those who are persecuted today are the non-Darwinists or the anti-Darwinists. Owen Gingerich, for example, a professor at Harvard, he said that scientific censorship remains in our world today and it may well be far more effective and insidious than in the 17th century during the time of Galileo. That's quite a quote. Quite it is quote. very, very telling. This is a professor at Harvard who just retired, by the way, uh, not too long ago. And what people who oppose Darwin are saying is we simply want a place at the table. A lot of people say, well, you want to take over the schools. No, we simply want to be able to prevent, present sorry, our ideas at the colleges and universities. Far from the Dark Ages, which it is popularly called, the Middle Ages might better be described as the Brilliant Ages, a startling epic of progress from science to art, from philosophy to medicine. Indeed, in one crucial way, we are less civilized than those who enhanced human existence over a thousand years ago. We dismiss the achievements of our ancestors and fall short of them. They honored their ancestors and surpassed them. I'm Anthony Esselin of Providence College for Prager University. So as we finish, we're just going to put on screen as we go some key articles that people need to read because in those articles you have raised points that invalidate yes. those particular ideas. So as we go, we'll just put those on screen. And, yeah. uh, and we want to appeal to our brothers and sisters in Christ to seriously weigh these issues. <laughs>